you live, eat, and sleep the hotel industry? Looking to brush up on your game? You've come to the right place. Welcome to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. All right, I got Adrian Curry with me, one of my uh, favorite and more frequent guests these days because uh, I was part of that exciting uh, road to 200 for Home to Suites. Now, for those of you who don't know Adrian, he's the global head for Homewood Suites by Hilton and Home to Suites by Hilton. Oh, I finally got that right after all this time. Adrian, how are you, sir? I am absolutely spectacular. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Well, you should be because as we're recording this the previous Sunday, uh, you were at the the Super Bowl, so I'm extremely jealous of you. Or do I have to call it the big game? I don't want the NFL to get uh, angry at me over here. Oh, that, that that's a good point. Yeah, you, we had the wonderful opportunity to to go to the to the Super Bowl, and I got to tell you, just being in that stadium, first of all, the people. I, I'm from Minnesota, and the people of Minneapolis that that whole weekend we were there. They were absolutely spectacular. The, the Minnesota nice, they had these jackets on, Minnesota nice. <laughs> and that's exactly what, they, they were so much fun. So there was one instance, and I, I got to tell you just a quick Super Bowl story, that we were sitting in our section, and there was some Philly fans sitting about three rows in front of us. And one of the Philly fans uh, decided that it was his privilege to stand during the entire beginning of the Super Bowl. So the first few plays, he was standing up and he was doing some um, typical or, or what you would say prototypical Philadelphia kind of things mm -hmm. in the stand. And so one of one of the people what, was, was he directly in, in a cheese take, a cheese take or something like that? Was that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it was it was a, 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 a conversational. Let's right, okay, that way. So all right. <laughs> one of the fans who was who was right behind him went to get to security, and so this really nice Minnesota security guard comes down, mm -hmm. and he looks at this gentleman from Philly, and he goes, "So there, you know, sir, uh, you know, you're at the Super Bowl here." and uh, these people here can't see when you're standing up. And he said, hey, you know, I've paid X number of dollars for these tickets, and if I want to stand, I will stand. And the nice Minnesota security guard said, well, you know, sir, these, these nice people around you here, they also paid all that money for their tickets, and they'd like to see what's going on there. So I'm going to kindly ask you to sit down. And he said, I'm not going to sit down. He said, oh, well, then I'm going to kindly let you know that, that we're going to bring a couple of my best buddies down here, <laughs> and, and you're going to lose the value of those tickets. So I would highly suggest to you, sir, that you sit down. Right. <laughs> and he sat down. And, and the Minnesota guy was so nice about it. And, you know, you, you could it was absolutely so much fun to watch there is hospitality at the uh, uh, there there uh, is now i could picture that happening at a jets or giants game out in jersey <laughs> i i do not see that scenario going in exactly the same way <laughs> you think yeah i don't know no, but it was wonderful and the game was absolutely incredible and and the halftime entertainment and for me it was a, a wonderful opportunity because i got to spend the entire weekend with my brother there and I haven't gotten to spend that much time with him in 20 years, and so it was an absolutely magical weekend for me. And it was a, a bucket list super, you know, Super Bowl in Minneapolis mm -hmm. with my brother. Uh, I mean, I'm 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 on cloud nine. Good for you. Well, I'm excited for you. Uh, a, a little bit uh, jealous of you at the same time, but that's okay. That's healthy. I like it. It gives me something to aspire to. I'm like, if Adrian can get to the Super Bowl, so can I. But more importantly than that, you now have more than 200 uh, home to suites by Hilton Open. And uh, Adrian, I got I to gotta make a confession. It took 200 openings for me to actually stay in one. I stayed in one in December in York, Pennsylvania. So now I actually feel like I know the brand. So I'm very excited about that. Awesome. Well, well, thanks for staying with us. And we're, we're so excited about getting to 200. You know, it's been a very quick journey to get there. And, and when we opened that one in Miramar, uh, Fort Lauderdale, right there at the, at the end of December, it was a wonderful feeling for us as the brand. So uh, it's so exciting how the ownership groups, the development groups have, have adopted this brand and have built it. So uh, we're extremely appreciative for everybody who has built one of these hotels and right. We're going to help them make some money in the process. Uh, well, I'm not nearly as happy or appreciative as you are because I guess Savannah and I was wrong and I'm still smarting from that decision. I think you guys all conspired against me with this fake news of Miramar thing. And uh, I think Savannah was still number 200. At least that's what I'm going to tell myself um, as I rock myself to sleep every night sucking my thumb because I'm so sad over this decision. 
We, we were actually pretty excited to, you know, sometimes in this, in this chase of, of PR that we do, that you would, you would say that we would select the 200th hotel and kind of <laughs> set up for this one. We, we really wanted to, to, to play this one. So we appreciate all the, all the wonderful journalists that we had uh, who had, who had participated in this little game with us. And so we did, um, I think, um, and, and it was all about the fun of it. Yeah. There, there was, and, and, uh, nobody got it right. And everybody was kind of thinking that we were going to point this in the direction of the best PR value. Oh, I will tell you, Miramar is an absolutely wonderful place. If you get an opportunity to go down there and stay at the home, home too down there, you will completely enjoy it. But um, it, we did, we, the I in Hilton stands for integrity. And so we put integrity into this contest. I love that. I love that. And congratulations to the media team. I thought this was such a fun idea to be able to uh, do this. And I really love being a part of it. So uh, thank you to uh, everybody for including me in that. So uh, Adrian, what's going on now at Home Two Suites? You've built up to 200 so so now is it all just going to be uh pure joy and happiness now that you're over the 200 mark what's next well you know the the, the really amazing thing for this brand is the, again as i've described the adoption from from the developers that are out there so we have well over 300 hotels in the pipeline which is and insane. we're anticipating oh yeah I, you know and um, I, I will tell you, you know, we have some friendly competition with our, our sister brand with True, which is a phenomenal brand. Uh, but between those two, two hotel systems, franchises, that, that we have a large number of hotels. Now, True is growing faster because every hotel they open on a percentage basis at this point you know, it's a, a 20% growth with the next <laughs> one. And, you know, and, but, but with the numbers that we've got for those, those two systems are truly phenomenal and we're very excited. And, and even for, for us, we've had some incredible milestones with our all suites category. So with home two, we've opened number 200, uh, 250 with the embassy brand and 450 wow. with the Homewood brand. And so very exciting, the growth we've been able to have with these brands. And we're just looking forward to, to keeping that momentum going. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really amazing to see um, what, what's happening, especially in the all suites category. I, I talk about it all the time. A lot of times I refer to it as, a, as a extended, ta- extended stay. It really seems to be the darling these days of the hospitality industry. So it must be exciting for you to not just be behind a brand that seems to be catching fire, but an entire segment that seems to be doing really phenomenal compared to uh, traditional hotel lodging. And, and you want to know what the reason for that is? Uh, I'm going to guess it's you. No, no. And this is the really cool part. Um, I was talking about this the other day, but I will go into an owner's orientation. And in that owner's orientation, these are people who are building uh, a Homewood home too. And, and it kind of works together for the, for the embassy suites brand also. Uh-huh. But the first question I'll ask in my owner's orientation is why do you build a hotel? And it's really interesting that, you know, we'll have 50 people in the room and they're all in some phase of construction or pre-opening process. And it's really quiet in the room. And finally, somebody from the back of the room will inevitably say, we want to make money. And I go, (laughs) yes, that's the right answer. You want to make money. And that's why you build one of these hotels. And so what we're, and I don't know why we as an industry are afraid to admit that the reason for doing this is to make money. And, and the idea of what we're doing with Home 2 and Homewood and Embassy is you look at these brands and, and uh, for Homewood and Home 2, for example, 70% of the occupancy comes from the honor system. So you're not having to go to OTAs and, and doing all of those other conniptions to try to get occupancy to come into those hotels that the honors system is working for the hotel. So you've got that, that, that is the lowest price distribution point that you can have driving occupancy in there. And then we focus extremely heavily on driving margins for our owners. So we're constantly looking at what can we do to help the owners make more money? Because why are we in the business? Hilton is in the business also to make money. And the more of these hotels that open, the more that we have in the pipeline, they get open, they're successful that there is this cycle that happens that more people build them. We make more, our owners make more, and, and it's been really exciting. So the real reason that we've got so many hotels in the pipeline, and especially for Home 2, is that the owners that have built them have felt the power 
of this model and they're reaping the benefits on the bottom line and that's helping us drive that pipeline going forward for home two, for Homewood and for embassy suites. Right. I thought it was because of your amazing skills at planking, but I think that that makes a lot of sense to me. All right. I, yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, well, you know, and from, from planking, you know, I, I, I did my 11 minute plank and I am only seven hours and 50 minutes from the world record, which is something to shoot for. Seven hours and 50 minutes from the world record. So if you add uh, one more second a day as you were doing throughout uh, 2016 and, and 17, then uh, you, I think you can make it. Hundred, I will be 122 when I get there. <laughs> I've done the, done the math. <laughs> well, if it makes you feel any better, I feel like I'm 122 these days. Oh, my God. I, I ache all Excellent. over. But, uh, you know, we're not here to hear me co- complain about stuff. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> although I do, I, I do love it. And I think I'm pretty good at it at the, at the same time. And if you guys think I'm good at uh, uh, complaining about stuff, let me know at Traveling Glenn on Twitter and uh, Instagram. But uh, before we wrap up here, Adrian, um, where is this all going next, do you think, with the all suites extended stay category? What's the next big thing that we should be uh, thinking about? For me, I think that we're going to start to see um, an elimination or um, not having daily maid service. And I don't think that's a negative. The more I stay in these types of hotels, the more I experience service apartments, I'm starting to wonder why the hotel industry has gotten so fixated on that daily um, maid service when I think customers only think they want it, but they don't actually need it. Well, I think you're exactly right. One of the things that we heard clearly at the Alice conference is that the cost of operation is going up. And and we had this discussion, uh, interestingly enough, this morning with Rick Calling, who heads our BPS group. And we don't know where the labor is going to come from in the future for from the housekeeping aspect, that that the people who are housekeepers today – their children are highly educated. They're not, they're not going to want to follow in the footsteps of, of the folks who are doing that housekeeping today. And so the costs are rising. I know, for example, in the LA market, from what we heard during Alice, that housekeeping is, it's a $15 an hour job. Mm -hmm. And I think you get an hour out of LA and it's a $13 an hour job. And so we have to look at systems that are going to make that more efficient. So home two has been a trendsetter in that area. And we've got something called light touch housekeeping and light touch housekeeping. Mm. I, you know, we, we, we have the ability to, to do a light touch in the room that is much more efficient than a full clean every day. And the advantage of that is the extended stay nature of that hotel. So when you're there, five plus nights, maybe it's a little bit less important. And with the rate that you're paying a little bit less important to have that sense that the housekeeper is going to do the full clean every day. So we've been doing light touch housekeeping uh, since the inception of the brand. It's been so successful for the home two brand that we have also rolled it out into the Homewood brand uh, as that part of that. Now you still get, if you need fresh, clean towels, you get fresh, clean towels, you get your, you get your bed kind of, you know, made, but you know, we're also testing some other things. Um, you've probably heard of the maid box that are out there. We're, we're in mm-hmm. with a couple of hotels that are, are testing out maid bots. And we're just looking at what are our opportunities to help continue to drive that return on the owner's investment. And so we are constantly looking for anything that's going to get. And I think you're right. I think that just looking at the trends in labor of where is the labor force going to come from and what's it going to cost that we have to look at alter- alternative methods to deliver that service. So one of the things that, that Chris Nesteta talks about all, all the time is, is the difference between us and Airbnb. And the difference between us and Airbnb is we are hospitality and they are lodging. And, you know, there is a reason that you may choose to stay at an Airbnb, but the reason that you choose to stay with any one of our Hilton hotels is we deliver the light and warmth of hospitality to our guests. And so we have to stay very focused on how do we deliver that hospitality in an environment where the labor force is shrinking. So we just have to be better at delivering hospitality in the future through the team members that we have there and, and making those guests feel really good because they crave the interaction with people when they come into a hotel that you don't get in, in an Airbnb. And so we want to stay focused on 
how do you decrease the um, the cost during that for the housekeeping labor? But how do you take that? and maximize your ability to deliver the light and warmth of hospitality. Right, and I guess that really is the, uh, the the trick because you don't want the guests to feel like something is being taken away. You want them to feel that it's matching what their preferences are and their lifestyle. Um, for our listeners yeah. that aren't familiar with it, could you explain uh, Maidbox? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm... For our listeners that aren't familiar, could you explain the Maidbox concept? Maypox. Made, made box, you would oh, say? made box. Oh, made box. I'm sorry, sir. I have made pox. I'm going, what made pox? Chicken pox? Made pox? Yeah. <laughs> made, are made, made pox. Uh, no, he's a, he's the name of my new uh, digital hotel assistant, my yeah. robot. So, you know, we'll talk yeah. about that on another show. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's made by, it, it, essentially, it would be, um, uh, think of a Roomba. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that the Roomba would go in the room, so while the housekeeper is doing other things in the room, the, the maid bot is kind of doing that, that stuff that usually is the last thing before they go out of the room. And so it's decreasing their amount of time. So essentially they're multitasking when they go in, they're picking up the towels and all that. And the maid bot is coming in and doing a little bit of the, of the, uh, the housekeeping action that you don't necessarily, then you can, you can decrease the time uh, per room by a few minutes by having the maid yep. bot take that, that process over. So, and we know that that uh, I've worked with a gentleman by the name of Daniel Burris, and Daniel Burris is a futurist. And so what we're trying to do is look at the technology that's been invented today that will be perfected over the next 10 years so that we understand how that technology will have a an impact on our industry. So this is just one that we know that uh, I've got a I've got a Roomba at home. And so when when. My wife and I leave in the morning. She's got a little app, and and the little Roomba starts, and it does all the vacuuming right. for us. In in the and that just makes our life a little bit easier. Well, how does that then translate into the hotel room, and how do we minimize the labor? So that's that's initially where the maid bot is is gonna we think add a little bit of value. But there's going to be other things that 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 is going to be able to do as that technology expands to be able to say, can we then take some of that labor cost out, but still deliver the light and warmth of hospitality? Right. So what, one of the great reads that's out there, and, and, and I, I, uh, there's a book that was written back in 1954 by, by Kurt Vonnegut, and uh, it's called Player Piano. And in, back in 1954, Vonnegut predicted this artificial intelligence. The only thing he missed in writing this book back in 1954 was he didn't see microchips, and he, ha he has in his book warehouses full of vacuum tube computers <laughs> because he didn't understand how it was good. But in this world, all jobs are done by machines, essentially, except for one. And in the book, it describes it as a bartender, right? A bartender uh, that, that somebody comes into a bar and they don't want their drink poured by a robot. They go into the bar because they want the human interaction of the bar. So I kind of call this the cheer syndrome. When Norm walks into the bar in Cheers, everybody shouts his name, Norm. He could, got, he could have gotten the same beer at every hotel or every bar that he went into, but he goes to the Cheers bar because that's where everybody knows his name and he's recognized. And that's what we have to do is take that technology that's out there, have it do what it can do, but we need to deliver that light and warmth of hospitality. And, and we're going to have to figure out how we do that in the future. So if you read the book, it is absolutely amazing how he predicted this back in 1954, this crisis that we're going to have about what goes to the, to the computer and what do we do to maintain the light and warmth of hospitality. And, and uh, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing read. I, I've re I read it twice. I read it once about 20 years ago, and then I reread it last year, and he's, he's just, he nailed it. He just he nailed it exactly what's going on and what our what our conundrums are for our industry they certainly are and i i agree with you about the uh the bartender theory and i think that's why we see um hotel concepts and established brands kind of changing the way they're doing things to um cross utilize personnel in different areas because i definitely see oh, a day absolutely. i definitely see that day where they check you in and then get you a cocktail all in the same uh to the same place oh yeah it, it, it that you know we'll, we'll figure out exactly how it's going to work but but uh, it is all about that delivery of the light and warmth of hospitality. Yep, 
I see uh, barista in the morning, helps people check out, helps people check in, serves drinks at the uh, in the evening hours. At least that's uh, my prediction. Anything else that you're uh, super excited about before we wrap up? Well, I'm I'm looking forward to uh, Valentine's Day with my lovely wife. I, I will actually be in town for the first one in the last three years. So, and in case uh, Glenn, nobody has said this to you as Valentine's Day is approaching, I love you, man. Oh, and I love you too. This is the this this is the best. And I don't just love you for all your great hotels, but because uh, you inspire me to. Uh, to take care of myself and know that as a uh, parent of twins, if you can do it, I can do it too. So thanks for everything. You the man. You got it, Glenn. <laughs> and uh, I thank you all for for listening. Today is a kind of a, I think this is turning out to be a mini episode. So I'm going to run this prior to uh, to Valentine's Day. So you, you know, uh, Adrian and everyone listening, you obviously know because you're listening to it. So uh, thanks all for listening and um, make sure you drop us a line. Uh, my uh, email, Glenn at rouse.media or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Traveling Glenn. And be sure if you're on Facebook, go to Facebook slash no vacancy news dot no vacancy news and like our page. Follow us on there. Got lots of great things coming. We're really expanding and growing this company right now. And I want to thank each and every one for you of being a part of it and great folks like Adrian for helping supporting us over here. So thanks. And we'll be back next time. Have a question for your host, Glenn? Tweet him now at Traveling Glenn. No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast. We'll be right back. Hey, I'm Glenn Hausman, and you know me from the No Vacancy Podcast, but I have got an all-new show coming, and I'm partnering up with the number one guy in hospitality, Mr. Anthony Melchiori. Now, it's called the yin and yang of hospitality. That's right. So I need to know going forward, because I'm a control freak, Am I yin or yang? I'm definitely the one that starts with Y, and you could be whichever one you want to be. I'll be the one that starts with Y. All right, so you're going to have more great banter just like this every single episode on the yin and yang of hospitality found wherever your favorite podcasts are available. Any final thoughts? Yes, I'm yang. All right, I'm yin. Thanks for listening. Back to the show. It's No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. All right, guys, so one of the things that I want to uh, talk about today is some of the things that you guys can do and learn a little bit more about issues like key money in the hospitality business because, uh, you know, quite frankly, I may know what it is, but you guys out there don't do. And I really want here on the No Vacancy Podcast to educate you a little bit more on the issues. And I know I've got a lot of younger folks that are starting to follow this show, and I want to give you guys insight on how to be most successful. Now, I obviously couldn't do it on my own, so I brought in, uh, you know, Rahul Patel. He's an attorney with Patel Gaines, PLLC. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. I'm really looking forward to, uh, you know, learning. I think that when it comes to issues like uh, key money, it's one of those things that I think I know a lot about, but I probably don't know nearly as much as I think I do. So I'm probably really dangerous when it comes to this topic. So I want to thank you very much for being here to uh, go through this and whatever else comes up in this uh, conversation. But before we get started, Rahul, um, maybe you could just orient us. Who are you, dude? <laughs> Sure, sure. So, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm born and raised in the hotel industry. My family grew up, uh, you know, owning and operating hotels. My, from my, you know, my parents, my aunts and uncles, uh, most of my relatives, uh, my wife's parents uh, are in the hotel industry as well. So I grew up in the hotel industry, um, practiced in it for a while, uh, was in the development kind of uh, arena, uh, operational side right after college, and uh, decided to go to law school. And when after I graduated law school, uh, I in actually interestingly met uh, Pratik Patel, uh, who was a chairman, uh, who was a secretary of OHO at the time, and uh, he's from San Antonio and said, look, you got to get involved with the lodging industry more than you are, um, kind of kind of urged me into that industry uh, after I had separated from it a little bit, you know, getting back into law school, right. and I just found myself back at home, you know, being able to see uh, problems and solutions from the different side of it. So, you know, I've, we, we've represented over 200 hotels across the state of Texas. Uh, we've represented folks in numerous states against uh, predatory litigation. I teach a hospitality law class over here at the University of Houston. So, you know, I'm kind of born and raised in the hotel business, and uh, we just we just look at it from a different angle now. Oh, awesome. I, I, I love it. And I haven't met many um, guys that were raised in the hotel business that became lawyers. I think that must give you a very interesting perspective and a, a depth with the issues that other folks might not have if they weren't raised living and breathing in these hotels, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, I, I relate to many of these folks. So you, we have, whether it's an independent hotel operator facing an issue that they simply just, just weren't aware about, 
uh, or all the way to the franchise issue. So we see it kind of from both ends. And, you know, being being kind of invested in the hotel business, you understand sometimes they're not about the legal points, whether you're right or wrong. Really, it's about business. So sometimes there's decisions that have to be made that that they're against what was the correct decision, but really it's about business and economics and what's what to move. But but we have a unique perspective of seeing brands fail, brands being successful, uh, why a property might succeed, you know, also retrofitting. We've got a lot of properties that got lots of rooms, great highway frontage, uh, but maybe the occupancy levels start to fall, how to repurpose some of that space to be able to, to maximize the highest and best use of the property. So, you know, growing up in the industry really does give us an insight. Like I said, I literally lived in one of those uh, 40 room hotels um, that everyone knows about. And, and that's that was my life that was growing up. So, you know, from from renting rooms to now, you know, litigating, you know, predatory uh, ADA litigation, you name it, we've, we've come across that spectrum. Oh, yeah, man, this predatory ADA litig litigation thing is uh, out of control. And because uh, Rohu mentioned it, I'll, let, let's just explain what's happening there. Right now, folks that go onto Google Earth, if they see that your hotel doesn't have a pool lift, for example, on Google Earth without ever stepping foot in your hotel, they can sue you. I think that's insane. That is, uh, that's really ridiculous to me. Yeah, it's absurd. It's absurd. It's all over the country. I mean, we've got some attorneys who filed over five thousand lawsuits in a period of a couple of months. I feel so. like this is the um, this is that new. You know, the, the Texas is uh, is like home to uh, podcasting sewers, be, uh, people that sue uh, against podcasts, and 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 yeah. also <laughs> it's interesting. I feel like uh, this is that new thing where it's completely uh, rude and unreasonable. And just doesn't have any uh, logic to it. But something that does have logic to it is key money. Rahul, you like how I made that uh, transition yeah, okay. over there? Right. I know. I know. That's why, um, that's why I'm here doing this uh, show for fascinating transitions like that. That's why you turn into the, the uh, No Vacancy podcast every week. So, Rahul, what is key money? <laughs> Uh, key money, you know, it's it's been around. It's not something that's that's new, but I think it's something that's picked up quite a bit of momentum over here over the last couple of, uh, sure. last couple of years, primarily. So it's really, you know, each each hotel has has a door, which is which essentially has a key to enter that room, right? So what what the brands have been what have been doing, especially with the proliferation of new brands, is is offering an incentive to develop that hotel with that affiliated flag with it. So to kind of say, if you were to develop 100 rooms, that'd be 100 keys, and you would get an incentive for developing. 100 keys if you were to do 150 maybe 150 key so each each door essentially gets some incentive to build it and put their flag on it yeah it's really uh it's interesting to me that this is happening now because i got it in 2010 right 2011 but right now it seems like everybody is in overdrive and there are so many properties being developed uh, my guess is that because of that heightened competition right now, everybody's trying to get, uh, let's just say, their fair share. So this is a way that they're trying to approach it. Is that the right philosophy, or am I missing something, Rahul? You know, I, I think it's it's a combination of that. So first, you've got you've got a, a, a whole lot of development going on all across the country, right? Areas: Nashville, Austin, San Antonio, Dallas. Um, you know, you, you name it. There's quite a bit of development going on, which means that's good for the hotel industry. But right. with that being said, there's a lot of competition. So which each of these brands, many of them, you know, I would say kind of legacy brands, Wyndham, uh, Choice, Hilton, Marriott, they've been around for quite a bit of time and they're creating new brands either to maybe di distance themselves from an existing brand that might have, might have aged itself out. And in order to attract the developer to do 120 keys on their asset on a new or an un, you know, kind of uh, a brand without any sort of foundation to it. Uh, the core is there, but the actual brand itself doesn't have any following. They've had to give some incentives out. So it's it's kind of a race to build the quickest and the fastest and also to get their flag on it. So if you look at brands like Glow, Vibe, True, Moxie, Cambria, Radisson Blue, uh, Send, Even, Centric, um, a lot of these hotels, people most of the average hotel uh, stay, per, you know, user doesn't has never heard of these brands. They've right. heard of Holiday Inn, they've heard of Choice, they've heard of Wyndham, but they haven't heard of these brands. So, how do you get uh, a developer to put in ten to fifteen, twenty million dollar investment into a project uh, with basically a brand itself that doesn't have any following? Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because you're not just um, building a hotel that'll go into the reservation system. You have to have that component where the customer understands it. So theoretically, then this is going to offset that risk that the developer is taking in order to uh, say yes to that particular project. So if I was to develop, I'm just going to say a major brand randomly, Courtyard by Marriott, right? Um, that wouldn't necessarily 
get the key money because it's so built out. Same thing with a, uh, a Hampton, but a Cambria Suites, where I know that Choice Hotels is really trying to push really hard, is a hotel that might do it, including some of the examples that you gave as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's kind of a development strategy. So if you look at Hampton Inn, they've developed their brand uh, over the course of time, right? They, you know what you're getting from the product, from the standpoint, wherever you go, uh, you know, they've done an excellent job of maintaining their brand standards, phasing out properties that have aged aged themselves out rather than allowing themselves to continue to uh, put property improvement plans into place. So you go, you don't go to a property that's 30 years old, that's got a, a rent, exterior, exterior corridor, kind of entrance versus an interior quarter. You know what you get. They've done a great job of building that brand. Now you've got a brand like Cambria, which if you go there and you stay there, you love it. You say, this is a fantastic stay, a great experience, but not a lot of people know about it. So you got to get people in the doors. You got to get people staying. You got to, and then you also have to pull people away from other established brands. Like you said, Courtyard, Hampton, Fairfield, you have to pull them away from those, 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 uh, those hotels to come stay there. So this is kind of a way to be able to entice the developer to build it and also maybe to build a superior product to currently what they might be able to do to be able to entice those folks there, right? So it's not just a matter of giving them a dollar to, to build a hotel. It's really to make sure that they build something that's successful. Right. Now, is this actual cash that they give you a check in or is it just, hey, you're going to get a million dollars off fees over X amount of time? Or maybe it's a combination of things. Yeah, it's, it's actually a combination. So it's structured based on the brand. So what I would say is in typically key money incentive typically is going to look like an actual cash injection, whether it comes in the form of a check, a deposit. Uh, sometimes it's keyed off when construction happens, when it begins. Sometimes it's phased out over the construction period. Sometimes it's phased once the construction's done, they kick in their portion after you've actually, you know, uh, uh, honored your portion of the agreement and, and built that. So it really varies depending on the actual situation itself. Um, but you know, it, it's we've seen brand fee reductions. Uh, there's some brands out there that are giving, you know, especially a lot of soft brand collections. So now some of the hotels are saying they're losing uh, franchise opportunities to say, folks are saying, look, I don't really want to be committed or tied to your brand because I want to be able to make a, a lobby differently than, than the others, or I want to make a guest room experience different than what the brand standard allows me to. So they're losing some some market share there, right? Uh, and especially with Air, the prol- proliferation of things like Airbnb, where people are looking for a unique stay. So what they're doing now is a soft brand comes around, allows you to be your own brand, but be affiliated with the reservation system. And in there, they might be more incentive based in terms of feed reductions as opposed to cash money up front, because you're not really committed to them, but you're partially committed to them. So right. to answer your question, I would say it comes in various forms. Yeah. You know, it was one of those things as I was asking this question, <laughs> I, I realized that it's probably all over the place and each deal yeah. is individualized. And I would even argue that um, you mentioned Nashville, uh, you mentioned uh, Houston in as part of your uh, introduction over there. But I'm thinking those already have such robust pipelines that perhaps it's not a city necessarily that they'll pony up all that key money where there might be some other underbuilt cities that might do it. But maybe at the same time, it just has to do with each of the specifics of the brand and what they're trying to achieve. So uh, how do you make sense of that? Yeah, it's brand, it's brand sensitive. So right now, Cambria, for example, is going after uh, high barrier markets, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, if you apply for a Cambria, and I, you know, not speaking for choice, but you apply for a Cambria in a small small market town, right. you may not get approved. Even yeah. if even if you've got a site, you've got a site under control, you've got a demand generator, what they're looking for is that New York, Austin, LA, DC type feel, right? Where you go and see a W or a uh, Regis or a Renaissance, you're not going to see that in any kind of town, regardless of whether the market dynamics are there or not. So really, it's 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 completely brand specific. And there are brands though that are looking to, um, you know, they've got to have a national footprint. For right. example, even you know they they've got a great concept. Uh, it's a lifestyle concept. People who are healthier, we're looking for better gyms, better exercise opportunities, um, just more of a hangout spot when they go to a hotel as opposed to being locked in the room. But the problem is, is just people just don't know about it, right? So you gotta, you gotta get some brands, you gotta get some affiliation because if you stayed in a great one in San Antonio, but then you can't find one anywhere else you go, you, you probably don't have the brand loyalty. But so yes. you need locations to be able to say, it's like McDonald's, you know, it's not the greatest burger in the world, 
But everywhere you see a McDonald's in your un- uncomfortable area, you just pick McDonald's and you eat there. Right. right. Okay. So yeah. um, to, to break it down a little bit further, um, I would like to say if you're interested in learning more about Even Hotels, check out my interview with uh, CEO of America's from IHG, Ellie Maloof, which actually ran in November of 2016. But I think it's still absolutely relevant. But more specifically to your point, uh, Rahul, using Even as an example, they made a deal with Concord Hotels, for example. They've got a number of them now in New York City. So – it's perhaps they wouldn't offer key money for another New York City property, but they would offer key money for a market that they're more interested in getting into because it's going to help with their overall strategy and distribution. I'm just using them as an example, but uh, I think that is a general rule that applies. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I think it does. I think, you know, it's it's all about uh, what uh, kind of to some extent the levered position you have. Right. Hilton and Marriott have done an excellent job with customer loyalty, brand loyalty and also the developer loyalty. They've seen the returns um, from the developments that they've been able to do. Some of the other brands have been uh, not as consistent. Right. We've seen a change in the brands from a strategy, from the type of portfolio saying we're only going to do new new construction and then also allowing maybe conversion properties in certain instances. So I think it's it's a position of leverage from the brand as to which ones want to give incentives and which ones don't. You don't see a lot of incentives coming down the pipeline from, uh, for example, from a Hilton, for you know. Uh, but then you see different incentives from 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 some of the other brands. So I think it's about uh, you know market penetration and then strategy, corporate strategy, what they want to do. Okay. Right? So what about maximizing your opportunity to get key money? Because sometimes they're going to let you know upfront that it's out there as an incentive to get you to do something, but it might not always be available unless you ask for it. Is that true? So what kind of strategy would you have for a developer trying to maximize their opportunity with key money in general terms with some of these major brands? You know, I think some of these new brands have a ton to offer uh, Mm -hmm. because I think the market dynamics are changing. I think the business consumer and traveler is changing as well. We've got a lot of young folks in the business space that are traveling, that are more willing to travel for corporate work than folks, you know, like us that have families that are established that don't want to travel as much. Uh, I think I think there's some a ton to offer. So what I tell folks is when they're looking at a brand to really do your homework on the brand, the market and what you're looking for and what your customers might want. And then I always say start the discussion with with multiple brands. I mean, there's there's brands that fall in the same space, whether it's uh, if you're looking for a health, health and fitness style brand versus a lifestyle brand, um, whatever that might be. You know, I think you really need to explore what the different options are, because when you get into these brand deals, you're in a you're not in a one or two year deal you're in a 20 year marriage. Right. So the <clears throat> the idea here is you can have a prenup and decide that you may get divorced or you go into the marriage finding one that will be successful for you, right? So I think when you start to have those discussions, a couple of opportunities arise. One, both of the brands, if there's two of them looking for the same opportunity in market space, they're going to put their best foot forward right. if they want that opportunity or not. So then some of that comes back on you. If you're a good developer, you've got a good location, a good site, and a good market, they will put a good, better deal up for you if they know someone else is possibly fighting for that space. And if there isn't, then the best deal that you get is probably going to be the one that, that they offer for you, if that right. makes sense. Yeah, right? that abso- so absolutely makes sense. Discussion. Just like when you're in college, you date. Just like in this opportunity, you got to date and find out which is the right fit for you. Yeah, that, that that's uh, perfectly logical to me. And um, also, just so the folks listening out there understand that sometimes um, – you have an opportunity with some of these brands that you may not all have also. So you've got to get out there. You've got to ask. You've got to see what the deal is. And they may even have sites for you available as well and key money on top of that, making the developer's job a whole lot easier. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I think that's another strategic advantage. For example, Cambry has done done a great job of that. They have kind of under the radar acquired several you know, ideal locations, right? Mm -hmm. So what that does is give them the leverage and say, look, we are going to look for the right developer who can develop this project for us because we've got, you know, a great location downtown, you know, near the metro stops or near the business hub centers. So there's an incentive there for the brand also because they put the time and money and investment into finding the locations to help the developer become more successful, right? So there's a trade-off there as well. If you've got a great site, you've got investment there, um, you may not get as much key money possibly, but you've got a site that's going to lead to success. Right. Now, how does that work with uh, with sites? This is something I never thought about until just now because I hear a lot of my franchise uh, sales friends saying, hey, we'll bring sites to the people. We'll bring sites to the people. But do I as a developer then lease it? Do I buy it from them or how does that work? 
typically what there is is in you know again this is one of those things where each deal could be site deal specific right yeah uh, but typically what I, what what I see is is that the 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 brand owns the the property under it either in their name or in an affiliate and there's a deed restriction placed in there for them to be able to say if this deed would transfer to someone but it must maintain a certain flag to it right so if I come along and I want to build it or want to buy it I ultimately will ultimately will either get the site from the brand uh, with a you know with a simple transfer of the deed or I may have to purchase that or I may have some sort of uh, favorable financing term for the site itself maybe right. you know zero um, percent interest that burns off after 10 years so as long as I maintain my brand for 10 years I really don't owe you anything I don't have any liability and my, my liability for that burns off the brand for them they got a 10-year commitment they wanted a 10-year commitment and they got it Right. right. So it's kind of a win win for both situations. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it seems like we've been talking a lot about win, win, win. But is there anything um, negative about getting uh, key money and tensions for brands that people should look out for? You know, this is this is the catch 22 yeah. when, you, when you're an attorney and it sounds like a self serving comment. But I'll tell you, the, you know, there, there's a lot in the documents that have to, has to really, really be looked at. Key money incentives are many of the ones that we work on, our firm works on, are typically in high barrier markets or larger markets, larger development deals, right? 10, 15, 20 million dollars. Those projects have one inherently longer life cycles to be able to develop it, get the permits approved, get everything ready to go, architectural engineering, and actually get the project moving, right? And in that instance, you have to really look at how the key money incentives are structured. We've seen them where they essentially expire right. if the property doesn't have an opening date by a certain day, if it doesn't have meet its construction schedules. So you really have to, you know, we spend a lot of time and energy having discussions with the brand folks and saying, look, we've got to have these factored in extensions and continuances as long as we're making good faith efforts proceeding and moving forward. Now, they'll always tell you, oh, well, look, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. That's just standard milestones. But those milestones are incredibly important because now what you're looking at is if you break a milestone, essentially you're in breach of a contract right. agreement, not making those. And second, they're not on the hook anymore contractually for, for giving that money in which you were relying on or maybe you have made your financial projections on, right? So it's very, very important to have a good open dialogue discussion. It's not one of those contentious discussions, but you really got to hammer that out because if you look at the baseline docs that come through, there they don't give you a lot of flexibility. Right, because this is, this is a, a very important issue to me because I've never developed a hotel before. But lately, I mean, I really would love to do that, right? <laughs> I, I don't necessarily have the time in my schedule, and I'm certainly broke. And if um, you want to change that, guys, go to my uh, Patreon uh, page, Patreon slash No Vacancy, and donate so I can build my own hotel. But more importantly, um, I, I feel like when it comes to a lot of these things, it's a situation of you don't know what you don't know, which is really becoming a, a big phrase of mine lately these days, right? So um, it's important to make sure you read all the documentation, make sure that you get an attorney that can help you out with all of this documentation and try to immerse yourself as much as possible in the uh, the, the, the learning um, world. I, I know AHOA is doing some really cool stuff right now with helping um, educate hoteliers as well, so I, I want you to check out AHOA.com, and they've got great um, packages and promotions and opportunities for you to learn over there. Rahul, what am I missing from all of this that I need to know today before we wrap up this conversation? You know, I think I think key money incentives are, are a great tool that's being utilized by the brand and the developer to really um, have an opportunity for a successful marriage moving forward. I think the, the key factor is they're not all the same. There are some of these key money incentives that look like key money incentives, but in, in essence, if you break these down, I have a developer that I talked to, it looked like a key money incentive. Right. And we broke this down and said, it's not a key money incentive, it's a loan. Mm -hmm. Because all they did was hmm. refactor the, the, they refactored the franchise fees huh. to, to offset for that. And the way I look at this is said the more successful we are, the more expensive this loan becomes for us. So it right. factored into being essentially an eight or 9% loan, because if you looked at it off of the royalty fees and the Whoa. increase, so if you look, if you were doing $3 million in revenue and you had a 3% increase in your franchise freeze over a period of time or perpetuity, it essentially is a very, becomes a very expensive loan. Ooh. So you really have to look at these. They look like they're, they're great deals up front, but when you break these down, the way the mathematics work may not be to your advantage. You may be better off getting an expensive MES loan as opposed to getting that loan. That's right? really, that's a fascinating point to me because one of the issues that I've been wondering about is where are the major hotel companies getting all this money 
which I would perceive as giving it away when they're public companies and they have to report their numbers every three months and uh, make stockholders uh, happy. So I think that that kind of explains where this is all coming from, that sometimes it's not just free money. It's actually being uh, disguised as a loan. It's yeah, a loan and some, being disguised as something else. So you, you have, there are a few brands that, that are – that the, their incentive money is actually couched like that. Right. Okay. So be smart, be careful, do what you're doing, and then go out there and develop hotels. Uh, Rahul, um, anything else that we need to know today? And then I'll let you do some super shameless plugs. No, I think I think uh, we've we've discussed most of it. I say make sure you read the details. The incentive money is 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 there, but it can be taken away. So you really got to make sure you understand the logistics of it, not just the numbers. Many folks just say, "Well, I get two million dollars." It is what it is, but that's not necessarily the case. It's triggered off of sometimes it's triggered off of the number of keys you do. So the question becomes is what if you reduce your keys by five or six percent based on some sort of city issue that you come up with or parking ratio commitment that you have? Well, in some instances, the way it's been drafted, you actually lose all of your key money because you don't hit the minimum room number count. Right. So you want to make sure that you allow yourself some variance and things like that. So reading the documents to the detail it's very very important just like a loan you're getting some money there's commitments tied to it you owe the money back if you for some reason if you default you 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 change flags so you really want to factor all that stuff in when you're when you're doing your due diligence here. oh my goodness all right so uh, thanks for that that was a really interesting conversation how can people find you Mr. Patel uh, you can find us on our website at uh, www.patelgains.com um, we're, we're on a, we're, we're frequently at a HOA conferences and, 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 uh, conventions as well. We speak at the co uh, HOA conferences quite a bit. Uh, and you can always reach us at our, at our, uh, via email or phone as well. Great. And, uh, speaking of a HOA, the No Vacancy Podcast, which you are listening to right now, is the official podcast of AhoaCon 18. So make sure you come see me. I'm going to be the one in the clear plexiglass booth with the giant red roof on top of it. Thanks, uh, Red Roof, for uh, sponsoring that. And I want to thank Rahul Patel for being here today. And thanks, everybody, for listening. And we'll be back real soon. Thanks so much for listening to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman, online at Rouse.media, on Twitter at Traveling Glenn, and on Facebook.com slash Glenn.Hausman. We'll catch you next time.